Thank you so much. My name is Deb Verhoeven. I'm the Associate Dean of Engagement and Innovation here at UTS in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I will be your umpire tonight. Um, and I know and you laughed, see, and I think that's a little bit like finding out that Razor Ray is getting the grand final again. So uh, there will be a few rules, and I will be arbitrarily interpreting them. Um, <laughs> It's good protocol, of course, to always acknowledge the land on which we meet. And I think that um, the acknowledgement that you see at the beginning of events at UTS and more broadly now around Australia is incredibly important to remind us that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. It's also good protocol to let people know where you're from. And I think that that's something we often forget. We like to acknowledge the land on which we stand, but not necessarily the land from which we come from. And in Melbourne, uh, where I'm from, um, that's a kind of an interesting art because it's not just so much your suburb or your school or where you came from in terms of all those demarcation points. It's your footy allegiance. <laughs> it's very important you tell people what footy team you barrack for within the first, I don't know, minute maybe. So Louise and I have already done this. <laughs> she did it. Yeah, her first question to me was who do you barrack for? She didn't even ask who I was. I was like, well, who are you looking to see? Who do you barrack for? <laughs> So to, um, when we have the Q&A a little bit later, um, it's uh, important that you do acknowledge which team you support before you speak, OK? And if you don't, there will be repercussions for incorrect disposal of the question. <laughs> 50 metres takes you somewhere out there. Um, I'm slightly serious about that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, my uh, fascination, I guess, with art and football has deep antecedents, and I didn't realise quite how deep they were until I, I went back and I looked at something I wrote um, about 25 years ago in this book called Boys and Balls, uh, which was put together by Brian Nankervis, and it's a, a kind of collection of anecdotes about boys and balls. Um, and at one point, uh, he asked Ted Whitten, you know, what is it about boys and balls? And Ted Whitten says, I don't know, why do boys play with balls? Probably because it's the first thing that they get hold of when they wake up in the morning. <laughs> um, so it's, you can imagine what kind of book it is. <clears throat> so I was, I was looking back over what I'd written so many years ago about football, and it occurred to me that I had this formative experience in relation to football, which occurred when I was in primary school. And I was nine. And it was grade four, and the boys in my school went out on strike. The boys' football team went out on strike. I'm just going to read a little bit of, of my response to what happened. So, For some reason, it was a really industrially motivated school, Caulfield North Primary School. And there were two strikes in this particular year. The first strike was over the art teacher. And the second strike was over the football teacher who kicked a football at, deliberately at the head of some kid. The whole class went out. It was really horrible. We're not playing for you, you bastard. He wasn't liked, and although he didn't mean it, I don't think he ever apologised. Everyone was a little bit hyped that year. It would have been about 1973 or 1974, so there was a lot of industrial action happening generally at the time. Strikes were in fashion. This is grade four or five. Anyway, the boys went out, and the girls, who until that time had been relegated to a small corner of the asphalt playing elastics, decided that this would be a fabulous opportunity to play football. So we formed our own team. Most of us knew how to play. We'd just never been encouraged. So we went on and played a match. I'm not particularly proud of being a scab football captain, <laughs> but half forward flank felt pretty good. We won the match. And I think that that was part of the problem because the boys then broke their strike and came back immediately. I think if we'd lost, they would have been quite happy to let us humiliate ourselves game after game. It was a great game, and I remember having a great time sort of thinking that we should play football every week, but it was just a one-off. Um, I'm happy to say that it's no longer a one-off. And tonight on the panel, and I'm going to start introducing our guests, we have with us a member of the inaugural Australian Football League Women's League, and that is Louise Stevenson. <clears throat> Louise plays for the Greater Western Sydney Giants. And if you Google her, it's fascinating. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because what you get are a lot of stats. It's just data. Everywhere I looked, I can tell you your AKI, AHB, AMK, and BV ratios. <laughs> 
I've got the, they're all here. Um, <laughs> how many games? <laughs> It's fascinating. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting that now when you look up a player, the first thing you get are data points. So, um, Louise, you're, you're the perfectly positioned person to be on this panel tonight. Thank you. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you. Adam Goods is a champion Australian rules football player who played with the Sydney Swans 372 games, I think, something like that, uh, between 1999 and 2015. He holds an elite place in AFL history, winning two Brownlow medals and two premierships. He's a four-time All-Australian, member of the Indigenous Team of the Century, and has represented Australia in the International Rules Series. He also has established the Go Foundation with Michael O'Loughlin, which empowers the next generation of Indigenous role models in all walks of life. Uh, and of course, he's the on the he's named on the. Um, a Lachlan Goods, or is it the Goods O'Loughlin Medal? I can't remember which way it goes. <laughs> First, second, you know. Who's competitive here? Um, which was awarded last week. And it's kind of interesting because that was a Sydney Swans Carlton game. It certainly was, and yes. And we will be talking tonight about a Sydney Swans Carlton game. So how exactly. is that for timing? Very good. Um, immediately to my left is Kim Vinks, who's Professor of Interactive Media at the Swinburne University of Technology. She's a researcher in creative arts whose research addresses the intersections of art, movement, performance, and technology. She has a very interesting disciplinary background because she's both worked in the field of dance and choreography, but also as an optometrist. Yeah of all things, <laughs> the perfect combination <laughs> for someone interested in motion capture and, and interactive art. Um, Kim has been a choreographer for over 20 years and has created 21 digital technology artworks in the last 10 years um, and has, in a sense, touched AFL as well because in her role as director of the Motion Capture Lab at then Deakin University, um, did quite a lot of analysis of kicking styles using motion capture. So, um, how to effectively drop the ball onto your foot. Yes. I believe. <laughs> in detail. Aaron Coots, who's sitting next to Kim, is the Distinguished Professor in Sport and Exercise Science at UTS, and he's the Director of the Human Performance Research Centre. He's published more than 200 peer-reviewed papers, mostly focused around developing an evidence base for improving performance and health for athletes. He has more than 20 years of experience of working in high performance sport and consults to many other organisations. And I could go on and on and on because he's highly <laughs> accomplished, but if I did, we would never actually get to the topic. Um, and of course, the man of the moment is Baden Palethorpe, who's part of a generation of artists whose practice has been shaped by internet culture. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Uni at Un University of New South Wales Art and Design. Um, and he's part of something that has a really interesting acronym there, which is ICE, the Interactive Cinema Experience. Is that right? How, what does ICE stand for? ICE Cinema. ICE Cinema. So it's Interactive Cinema, yeah. yeah. Basically, yeah, it's similar stuff to what Kim, Kim Vinks works in. Okay. Much of his work consists of <coughs> hyperreal animations, video, and sculpture that engage with the spatiality of power, politics, and the cultures of late capitalism. Just a small task. <laughs> yeah, just a little, just bite yeah. off a little thing and try and deal with that. It's manageable for now. <laughs> In 2013, Baden was invited to be the inaugural artist in residence at the Australian War Memorial. He's had a bazillion exhibitions pretty much all over the world. And if we put a tracker on you, it would be very interesting to kind of see what that... What that Mostly at home. <laughs> Working. Um, the way this will work tonight is I'm going to ask everyone to respond to the exhibition uh, just um, in their own words and thoughts and feelings. And then we're going to have a, a conversation and then we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, and we're looking forward to your questions and your responses as well. So I want to start by asking Baden to talk a little bit about what motivated you, what interested you in this. Are you a footy fan and who do you barrack for? Uh, so I'm a Swans fan. <clears throat> uh, you know, grew up in Sydney, so that's the kind of, I guess there wasn't any other option. So <laughs> until now, there is now. There is now, yeah. So I did see um, you two next to each other for a reason. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and I guess my interest in the, what, the motivation for this whole project was um, the Synapse Residency Program, which pairs artists and scientists together to kind of um, basically let artists and scientists tackle problems that 
um, kind of tackle escape. being the operative word there. Yeah. <laughs> Each other, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and in fact, I was listening before the the whole project might not have happened unless Adam came into my life a few years ago um, through some serendipity, I guess. But um, you know, football is such an interesting. Um, you know, sport is obviously a big competitive thing. It's it's um, it's not really seen as a cultural or an aesthetic. Um, pastime or activity, I guess. But, you know, when you go to the football, it's a really intense um, emotional experience. The, the, the feeling of the crowd is palpable. But, um, you know, there's no real way to kind of um, to measure it or to, to, um, to try and quantify it or measure it or, I guess, yeah, put a volume to it um, when it's obviously undeniable, I guess. So that was an interesting part of, um, I guess, the sports, science and art thing. I guess the languages of art... Um, if they do anything, they, they kind of tap into the emotional, affective kind of spectrum. So, so you're um, trying to capture using data yeah. a set of engagements or emotions. Essentially, yeah. So obviously in football, like all other sports at the moment, like data is collected in a massive way and everything's measured you know, to the millimeter, to you know, thousands and thousands of data points. And yet despite that, there's no way to measure you know, the energy of a crowd, really. So, I mean, I find that really interesting and, and that was, you know, part of the, um, I guess, the end of the, the, the exhibition in the end was to kind of bottle some of that intensity um, through the artworks themselves, but also through the emotional experience of being in a space that's conditioned through the sound of the match itself um, and some of the data that's collected to analyse the performance um, on the field. So it's kind of like giving the crowd an, a sense of being performative. It's capturing the performance of the crowd in the same way that we might capture sure. the performance of players. And part of the, what I like to do sometimes is kind of invert the way that something is, is happening already. So players are tracked and measured, so why not kind of measure the crowd and track them? You know, they're tracked, we're all tracked in so many other ways in our daily lives anyway. So um, it's a quite a simple gesture just to invert that process um, to try and even just, just scratch at the surface and see what is actually there. Why don't we measure crowds? Do you think it's because they're considered chaotic or somehow out of control? I think they are <laughs> chaotic and out of control in a sense. I mean, they're measured in a lot of ways uh, through surveillance footage and yeah. um, you know, things that aren't necessarily... Sales point data. Yeah, it's all, but it's all to do with either um, criminality or commercialisation. And there's a big gap in the middle there, which is where actually the football lives, in a sense, and where the, the culture lives. I'm reminded of um, the really great 19th century data scientist explorer, Robert Fitzroy, who mm -hmm. he gave us the word forecasting, right? So he's the guy who invented a way to understand and measure weather. And weather was like we think of crowds now. It mm -hmm. was considered completely chaotic. You know, nobody knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. Ships would set sail and sink, you know, 10 minutes later mm. because there'd be a squall around the corner. And he, he really made a, a massive change to the way we understand what data can do. Mm. And I think sometimes that when you're an artist, you're working at that edge of the, you know, known unknowns. For sure. In a way. And I, I can see that, you know, we might end up in a situation where the kind of work you're doing becomes something we then do. We start measuring the intensity of crowds and we plan games. Like TV stations would have a lot of investment in thinking about how to mm. get crowds to hit high points at particular t points of a game or mm. you know, how would you choreograph a game to get better engagement. We never got the worm in debates. Yeah. That thing that sort of like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe we need something more than that though. <laughs> Aaron, you were involved in the project fairly early on as well. Yeah, yeah, Baden Cummings, the crazy idea. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that awesome. moment. And I thought... Um, I've got no idea what I'm doing here, but why not? You know, yeah. um, I'd spent 15, 20 years um, trying to understand performance, um, football performance. Um, the beautiful thing about football performance, it's almost unsolvable, so I'd have a job forever. Um, <laughs> we, used, you know, um, we use GPS, and you know, we use it mostly to understand performance and understand training, injury risk, quite of unsexy things in a way, but really that affect the performance of the football team, the health and the performance of the football team. And, um, but there's other areas that we'd known about that the inf understanding performance is very complex. Many things affect it. You know, there's not just the player, it's a coach, it's a crowd, any interaction bit around that. Um, and it was almost put in a too hard basket. We know that the crowd affects performance. Um, it affects umpire performance, it affects player performance. And that's something that we couldn't measure, but it was of interest. And um, when Baden came to me with the idea, I, I didn't know what he was going to do. I was totally biased, out of my comfort zone. I'm an empirical, data-driven scientist. I didn't scientist. know what I was going to do either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's trust, right? Um, um, so uh, I thought, why not? 
And it was like a, a journey that we went through that, you know, I just bade and led it and I sort of followed along the way. And it was, um, I learned a lot from the process. I'm interested in this idea that there is a crowd because, of mm-hmm. course, when you go to the footy, there are many crowds, right, the, the, uh, especially like somewhere like the MCG where you, mm-hmm. you try and get a, a Mexican wave happening and it always dies <laughs> and, then and then picks yeah. up again, right? So they're, you know, and they're obviously rival crowds as well. And we have a kind of interesting relationship to crowds with Australian football, which is very different than European football where they fence the crowds into segments. Because we don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, basically. So I'm interested also in this idea that there are kinds of different crowds of different games and different mm. cohorts of crowds and, and so on. Do you think that's somewhere your work will go? Potentially. Um, and a lot of this project was basically overcoming obstacles uh, from the AFL a lot of the time, but technically as well, because like there's talking about like you know pockets of crowds. Um, you know, there's audio that's recorded all around the stadium, but it's all um, recorded down to a stereo track rather than you know six individual uh, location-based um, recordings. And I tried to record location-based audio, but it just wasn't allowed. So those kinds of things would be really nice to get like really high um, resolution in a sense. Maps, you know, like everyone's got a microphone in their phone. Like there's all these ways that you could. Um, create really, really high resolution uh, data maps of you know the tiny little pockets and fluctuations of crowds. Because when you're at the SCG, for example, you know you can hear um, the crowd at the other end when there's action up there, um, but nothing's really happening. You know the member stand, for example, mm-hmm. um, and you can kind of it piques your interest a bit, but you know then it kind of it might like sort of catch like a contagion around. But um, it's a really localized thing. When you're on the ground, Adam, what's it like? What do you hear? Oh, look, I think it varies depending on the type of game it is. When it's a finals game, the intensity is so um, crazy that the noise just sounds like a murmur until you kick a goal and you actually have that short break of being able to absorb what had just happened with the crowd noise. Um, You always absorb the, the emotion of the crowd when the opposition score because it's either, you know, in your mind was, what could I have done? and you just hear the opposition crowd screaming, and then you get back to your position and they're still screaming because they've got this roar meter going on on the, on the, um, the, the, big, the big screens, and you're just like, okay, we get it, you scored a goal, now <laughs> shut up, like, this game is still going. So for me, um, you know, I try to block it out as much as possible because if I am thinking about what the crowd is doing, I've already lost five, six, seven seconds of actually not thinking about my role or what am I going to do next to counteract what they've just done to score that goal. So you, can you ever hear individuals? Like, Because when you're in the crowd, you can hear them all the time. I mean, that's part of the pleasures of being in a crowd sometimes is this membership of the crowd that can be quite funny or humorous. Or... Yeah, I think the only time you hear them is when you cross that white line whether you're going, you've ran over it close to the boundary or whether you've come off the ground and as you've come off the ground to have a rest, someone will stand up and go, hey, goods. And you, yeah. of course that gets your attention yeah. and you're like, what? What do you got to say to me? <laughs> what do you have to possibly got to say to me? Head coach is right here, but I'll listen yeah. to Yeah, you exactly. What, what advice do you have for me? And then he'll talk and I'll just go, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and, then just, and then just continue on, you know, like it's... Um, fair game to them being so courageous to stand up and give me the feedback that I might need. <laughs> um, but generally, in a, in a game, the intensity of the game just keeps... I know when I played my best football, um, my mind is in the moment all the time. So you don't really acknowledge too much that's going on around the outside of the ground, but your teammates, those distinct voices that you know so well through training and playing and um, going you know, through the trenches with those players, those voices really ping and you really listen to them calling for the ball or them actually giving you feedback. Can you distinguish between opposition players and, and your own team? Like I know, I know there's that lovely trick of you know someone yelling out, you know, pass it or there's someone behind you when there isn't and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I learned early on in my career that I wasn't very good at the no-look handball. <laughs> so I got told off quite early not to do those. So if I was handballing or kicking it to someone, I actually had to turn and then face and give it. But I've definitely pulled the wool over some people's eyes doing doing that trick because, yeah. you know, under pressure, um, you know, you've only got half a second to think, should I handball to that voice that's calling my name? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's nice to be able to do that at <laughs> <laughs> Louise, for you, the crowds are obviously going to be a bit smaller a bit. than an AFL grand final. <laughs> yes. What's that like? Uh, I mean, because, you know, the experience of a crowd when there's less a mayhem mm. and perhaps a little bit more coaching from the crowd or, you know, calling from the crowd, do you get that? 
Yeah, I guess um, our average numbers, I'd say, in an AFLW game would be maybe five or 6,000. Um, I know the first game in the inaugural year was 25,000 at Icon Park. So that was, from all accounts, I wasn't in that game, it was Carlton Collingwood. Um, but all accounts, that was just mayhem for those girls because we've, we've played in front of crowds prior to that of about maybe 4,000 maximum. Yeah. Um, so they were just absolutely flabbergasted mm. by the yeah. fact that they couldn't hear anyone, they could only hear the crowd. Um, so it's a really new concept for us and even 5,000 um, when we played home as the Giants in Blacktown, hearing the crowd is phenomenal and I can't even imagine what a, a grand final would be with 90,000 there. Um, but yeah, I guess we we still do train with, with music blasting so that we do lift our voices above um, what the crowd should be and, and try and train ourselves to, to hear our own teammates and things like that and, and get the voice up and the communication up. Um, but I think, yeah, hopefully in, in 10 years, maybe we do get 20,000 at every game kind of thing. But um, yeah, at this stage, it's not quite, I guess, as such um, a factor but you, st you definitely still hear the crowd, especially if there's a chase down tackle or an amazing goal. You know, you, d you do hear the crowd and it's, it's really great, I think. There still is something to those suburban grounds that you play oh, at yeah. where 5,000 people can sound like a lot because people are right on top yeah, of you. Exactly They're right, right up against the fence. Yeah. I um, went to the Cowboys and Tigers game at Leichhardt just a few weeks ago and there was 12,000 people at this suburban ground. It was packed and it sounded idea. just like an MCG with 80,000 people. Yeah. They were just crazy every yeah. time the Tigers scored. So the number does make a difference, but I think it's the, the tight knit mm. um, of the game and the way mm. the, the crowd is structured and having a grassy hill where people can just cram in yeah. and stand you know, really tight together and um, scream like they do is, is quite amazing. Yeah, the the uh, research supports that. You know, like it's the density of the crowd and the closeness of the crowd that makes the difference rather than the number. So, mm. yeah, once again, our, our data backs up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <definitely. laughs> It's funny, as a, as a kind of diversion, like a lot of the research I came across in the beginning was about civil engineering in stadiums. Mm. And so it was about not just the rhythms of the voices, but the rhythms of like the bodies moving up and down so the so those aims don't fall down basically so it's yeah. like all this energy is not just like emotional but it's structural and architectural as well yeah do you have a sense that you're you're in the middle of the sound that it's coming at you from all areas because when we hear um we, we you know we hear on the television the the you know the the, the crowd, the commentary, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not ambisonic, it's not yeah. around you, it's mm. just one channel. So how different is it to be right in the middle of it? I think for me, um, it's just a wave of energy that comes yeah. towards you. You actually do feel it, especially yeah. in places like um, Subiaco, um, the West Coast Eagles or Fremantle. Like, they are just absolutely crazy. And I think we're only allowed maybe a 1,000 tickets that go to Swans members when we play there. So mm. you're looking at 49,000 um, opposition fans, just heart and soul giving it every time they score a goal. And you feel that. Mm. And if I'm feeling that, then their players are feeling that and getting that uplift that you get yeah. from um, that momentum you can build of keeping the crowd on your side. Yeah. Are there any, ever any times when there's no sound as a player, like... When you're in the zone, is that a silent place? No. So you, you flip the role of exactly that scenario. So when we kick a goal in the last quarter to put us up by 24 points and you can just Bring hear those, <laughs> those people right down the end, up the fourth level go, yeah, go Swans. And just like this. <laughs> and you just know they're our supporters up yeah. there and that's when you know that you've absolutely killed the enthusiasm of the crowd because there is that deafening um, silence that happens, um, which is great because that's the one time that the opposition um, fans need to get behind their players. Mm. And so it works as a double um, energy builder for us. Yes, we scored the goal, but when we hear that silence, mm. it's like, wow. That's, that's, yeah. that's impressive. Did you ever talk yeah. about that? Did you ever talk about that? Like yeah, that's definitely. when you know you got them, and that's yeah, especially you know, the experienced yeah. players talk that when we know that we're going well, the crowd is just deafening quiet. Mm. And especially in the second half, when you get three or four goals up, you know you can take the crowd completely out of it. Just like if they kick two goals in a row their momentum builds, the players feel it, the crowd is buzzing, and they can just really get those players going. I'm actually yeah. a Swan supporter myself, and I went to a game one time with um, with my mum, and we were stuck for some reason in the middle of just a swarm of Collingwood. Uh. And it was, the, it was the worst thing ever because I thought, okay, Swans need some supporters here, I'm here wearing the red and white. 
and swans would kick a goal and I'd kind of look around and be like, go to Swannies and just do this little clap. And I was like, I really want to get up and about for them, but it was too scary. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm also conscious of silence that happens when there's drama on the field that, you know, um, does, it's not just about rivalry. So things like um, when a player's injured um, or those moments where you have the ball and you're just fo so focused on whatever it is that you're doing at that moment, streaming down the side or, you know, heading for goal or doing whatever it is you have to do, that there are moments when there, there is a kind of a form of silence that's, that's about you know, um, an, an amazing, amazing moment of athletic either prowess or drama or, you know, devastation or something like that. So there are these kind of really still points as well mm -hmm. in games. Do you experience them as players? I find with injuries, definitely. Because um, you can sometimes hear an injury and that's just one of those moments. Yeah, where... yeah, definitely that, um, yeah, like a bad head knock or, you know, a knee or something like that. And the crowd obviously go quite silent. There's nothing really you can say or do, and, and obviously the players as well. Everyone just goes, ooh, and that that's it. Um, we were actually at Dremoyne when a girl from Carlton did her knee, and she was really she's a really high player, and um, she's like the captain of their team and things like that. And no one wants to see that, of course. Mm. So the whole crowd, and, and and you know, it's not it's not a big. Oh, well, like you were saying with Leichhardt, it's, it's not very big, so everyone was in quite tight and everyone could see it right there in the wing. And it's it's one of those moments where it is just completely dead silent until the umpire, I guess, takes control of the situation and things like that. So, yeah. I think those quiet times that I really enjoy, you know, the, before um, the second quarter, the third quarter, and usually by the time you get out into position in the fourth quarter, the crowd's on edge. If it's a close game, you can feel that energy. So... Those moments of clarity, you know, before the quarter starts, where it's just like people, the expectation, you just don't know what the expectation of the crowd is. So for me, I like to think about, okay, well, what's my role? How am I going to get the crowd involved, especially if we're playing at home? Or how am I going to silence the crowd by, you know, making a good mark, you know, taking on a few players and kicking a goal? Because it's those sorts of efforts that could really, you know, start to shut up the crowd, which you're really trying to do it on opposition uh, fields. Kim, I'm struck by this idea that, um, you know, it's about the movement on the field also either, you know, when a game stops because there's an injury or when a yeah. game is poised before yeah. something's about to happen, that you get these pauses in the crowd energy as well. Yeah. So as a choreographer and someone who works with data and movement and choreography and, and you have worked with sports people, yeah. tell me something about how you feel in terms of the creative component of yeah. trying to do that? I think there's, there's something I think really, um, really profound about the shift from the individual person, player, crowds, experience. Uh, and, you know, the, to the other extreme, what you've done is take this, um, take this entire match and represent the whole thing. So when I'm working in motion capture, for example, the first thing that happens is you put ping pong balls on people. Mm -hmm. And basically at that moment, uh, the, the, the performer, uh, player, whatever, uh, becomes a device for transporting ping pong balls around. So their, their actual surface of their body means nothing to the system. The system only sees the ping pong balls. Mm. So once you've extract, you're, you're, you're doing this reduction, you're taking away the body and you're giving all of these data sets. And of course you can reconstruct a volume from that of a, of a body, but then when you take a, a GPS tracker, you've actually done another step right down to just where you go, so you're one marker. Mm -hmm. And there's something just incredibly reductive about that. Um, but then uh, once you do that, and I was looking, uh, Baden, at those beautiful tracking um, uh, diagrams, mm -hmm. just the, I think they were just the GPS tracking sure. and they look like these kind of filigree <coughs> webs of where, mm -hmm. you know, where the player goes. And uh, suddenly when you put the data back like that, you've got it, this bird's eye view of the whole thing. So a perspective that you couldn't possibly have. So suddenly instead of reducing the body, somehow you have this uh, massive wide open perspective of what that player did or what that performer did. And I, I, I think 
I'm not entirely sure what it means, and I think that's an important thing because what can that mean? What can it mean that you went there at that moment, that you went there at that moment? You can look at the whole thing and say, on balance, you know, we were talking before and, you know, running fast is really good. So, you you know, you really want to... actually not. <laughs> oh, no. I, well, or not running fast or whatever it might be. You pick one parameter out of that data and you say, well, we're looking at this in this instance. Mm -hmm. But then there's always so much more going on because mm. you're not running in isolation. You're running, you know, to avoid a whole stack of other people who mm. are potentially, pre pre you're presumably trying to run into you. Or <laughs> there's all of that going on. So uh, I actually wonder if uh, there's there's another way of looking at that, which is choreographic, which is the pattern of the whole yeah. thing. We, we actually we do look at patterns yeah. in groups and how they move and how yeah. much they change in relation to one yeah. another, but that's still not the whole story. Yeah. Well, I spent 20 years trying to figure this out and I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> you said the data's like useless, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's not useless, but it, like exactly as everyone yeah. would think, you'd think when you ran more, harder, faster, you'd played better. Mm. Yeah. But our data and every data for most large team sports is the opposite. Yeah. And oh, so good that's, then. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't mean the coaches want you to try your hardest. No, yeah. Yeah. It's not running more, it means trying hard. Anyway, um, but it's really but confusing. It so it doesn't relate directly to one no. particular outcome. So no, and then you need to put the ball in that, and yeah. then you need to put the coach's instruction into that, and then you need to put even the crowd into that, and it's, so it's so complex. Yeah, and that's why we'll have a job. Well, forever. it reminds me exactly. <laughs> I've done um, motion capture analysis yeah. of, of elite dancers, yeah. and we got four elite dancers to do the same. You know, mm. they learnt the same phrase. They did it over and over again. The the the, the mathematician wanted us to do it so many times. The dancer nearly fell over um, but so and then when we did this analysis it was just um, there were so many factors going on and in actual fact the dancers um, profiles we did this principal component mm. analysis the dancers profiles were far more individual to themselves than they were to the movement mm. Mm. they could have been doing any <clears throat> movement and they were just like themselves, mm. not like the movement. So, you know, I, I, at that moment, I sort of really, in terms of movement analysis, really went towards visualisation because I guess as a choreographer, you want to see the whole pattern. And you can put emotion into that. Yeah. That's a whole other dimension yes. that we've never had before. And that's what Baden's kind of provided here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, in it's, sense, that's why it's interesting as well. Like, it's the same... Rules the same teams, often like the same players, Different but it's never the same game. Yeah. And it's only because it's like it's such a human yeah. thing. And you know, part of the, the like the title of the show, Clanger, is is a statistical term for a silly mistake that that can't be really categorised, but has to be captured nonetheless. Mm. And that's like where mm. the the beauty of the you know that's why people are interested in, in going to games. I, I actually wonder if at some point in the far distant future, gosh, maybe ten years, um, but uh, that that we'll actually start to read these kinds of representations. So, you know, you might look in the paper yeah. and instead of the stats, yeah. there might be these, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, we do heat space. maps now. Yeah. So there's a exactly. heat map analysis of player movement and the exactly. AFL, yeah. AFL puts We had the I crowd mean, in that and we had actually the communication between the players to do that and instructions from the coaches. And with data now, you can capture all this. Mm. Now, that might help us understand it better. Who knows? But the so, data's there. Aaron, I was going to ask you about sabermetrics. Mm. Um, which are, were an interesting development in sports data yeah. analysis. So sabermetrics have been, this is the statistical analysis of baseball, which is an entire field, money so ball. to speak. Money <laughs> ball, money <laughs> ball, prediction. Yeah, money ball, not just prediction. So it started in sort of the 1850s mm. and um, it's evolved over time. And in the 1990s, a huge shift occurred in sabermetrics, mm. which is to take the focus off aggregate statistics of the game, which is sort of what we did in the AFL as well for years and cricket, um, and to start focus on, on player balance, team balance, mm. through analysing player profiles and looking at player data. Mm. And I suspect a lot of the tracking work we're doing will lead to that, we, which is yeah, what kind of balance do we need in a team in terms of coverage versus intensity versus... Because every part of the ground is not worth the same amount in terms correct. of potential points scored. Yeah. And like we've done boring things like create econometric models of the, what, what field position is worth what amount of potential points. And so you weight your players, which players do you put to get the right field position? And players never think about this, right, ever. Um, but we try to give this to, you know, inform <laughs> tactics and inform coaches, and sometimes yeah. that's up, taken up, sometimes that's not. But um, with data everywhere now, we can form econometric models or models of equity, 
of when you know, you're above and below expected for the field position, um, type of play, um, and individual contributions, which allows us to understand it better. We never understand it totally though, right? I always go for um, good old Jack Dyer's approach to statistics. Um, for those that don't know, Jack was a, a legendary player and commentator of Victorian football, and he was renowned for this thing called diarisms, um, which were, um, you know, quirky gaffes that he would tell all the time. So he would, um, he was once you know, interviewing some terrified young recruit clutching the 4 and 20 prize pie on World of Sport, and uh, he said, I've got three questions for you, mate. How old are you? What's your height? And how tall are you? <laughs> um, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that sport has its own kind of unique, uh, I guess, relationship to its, its histories and its own sense of measurement and, and, and what success means. And I wanted to finish up by reading from Boys and Balls again. Um, che Cockatoo Collins has this really lovely uh, interview in here and he talks about what keeps him going or kept him going as a footballer. <clears throat> and he says, once you've got the ball in your hands, you feel like you're the king. It's in your hands. When you're small, you might like playing video games, you like kicking the footy along with your mates, but then when you get older, you have to leave a few things behind. And it's when you've got the football, you feel like you can go forever. You become so good, you can become like your heroes. And I think that's just a, a lovely way to think about that idea of a different sense of tracking and how you measure success, which isn't just in terms of who's with you on the field, but all the antecedents that come before you and everyone who's going to follow you. And I think that expansive sense of how you measure success is a really good thing to hang on to at the end of, of such a great session. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Thank you.